Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. Today, we have a really cool piece on the HPE ProLiant Microserver Gen 10 Plus. We're gonna take a look at how you can take this really cool server and do things that HPE never intended for you to do with it, and that is a lot of fun. Now, we've already done a lot on the HPE ProLiant Microserver Gen 10 Plus. Specifically, we have an overview piece. We did a teardown of the Gen 10 with the Gen 10 Plus side by side. And then we just published our full review of the Gen 10 Plus on the STH main site. Now, when we did that review, we specifically focused on what are the things that HPE provides and you know what really comes standard, what are the normal options. Today, we're gonna get into what are the fun things and really cool things you can do with the Gen 10 and we've tested a lot of different options to be able to bring this video to you. Just to give you some idea, we tested a total of 16 DIMM configurations. We tested a total of 23 different CPUs in these systems. We tested a variety of NICs, storage devices, you name it, just to give our readers and you on YouTube a really good idea of what you can do with these boxes. If you see next to me, we have three units. And the reason we have three units is it was gonna take so long to get through our test plan with one unit that we needed three to be able to actually get this out in a somewhat fast manner. So these poor machines have been running night and day to be able to bring basically all the testing that goes behind a piece like this to you. Now, before we get too far in this guide, we really wanna talk about power. Now, the new ProLiant Microserver Gen 10 Plus uses an external 180 watt light on power brick. And that means practically that you get power limited often well before you get expansion limited. So if you take that 180 watt power supply as kind of an upper limit, just think with the Intel Xeon E2224 model that comes standard with two 16 gig DDR4 dims and one SSD installed, so not fully outfitted, not even close, you're still able to push over 110 watts, which means that you have no more than 70 watts available for you know customization. Now there are gonna be people, and there already are people customizing this platform with configurations that you know may give a little bit of a wow factor, but are actually kind of dangerous because when you exceed a power supply power limit, one of the things you have to worry about is, are you gonna create a fire? It's a low chance in a lot of cases, but it's one of those things that you just don't wanna do. So our guide is specifically designed because we've done the testing to not light your house, not light you know, your office, not light your branch office or your client's offices on fire because that's an important part, we think, to being able to do a modification video right. So realistically, the maximum headroom that we have for being able to do this customization is about 70 watts. But if you kind of take a step back and you were to give a little bit of a margin of safety, like a 10% margin of safety, you only have 52 watts to play with. And if you go to 80% of the circuit, it's even less than that. Now we're gonna go through this video and we're gonna have a lot of different items. We're gonna have some kind of idea in terms of timing in the description. Also check out the STH main site. We're gonna have the companion article to this piece and we're gonna have that updated with more information as we get it, but we think we have a pretty good body here. Okay, all the warnings aside, let's start talking about one of the most important and most frequently asked questions that we got when we published our original series of content, and that is memory. What can you do in terms of memory in the system? Now, HPE says that you can use up to 32 gigabytes of unbuffered ECC memory. We, of course, thought, that's great. And we tested it during our review because we had two 16 gig HPE DIMMs and it worked fine. But can you go to 64 gigabytes? The Intel specs on the Xeon E 2224 say that, yeah, you can go up to 128 gigs, which means you can use 32 gig unbuffered ECC DIMMs. And so we decided to try that, but we didn't stop there. We used four gigabyte, eight gigabyte, 16 gigabyte, and 32 gigabyte ECC UDIMMs. Now note, these are not RDIMs. And not only did we check the ECC versions, but we also said, hey, if ECC becomes capacity or supply constraint, especially given the current environment, well, can we use non-ECC memory and just use consumer memory? And so we tested a total of eight different RAM configurations in two DIMMs mode and in single DIMM mode, we tried them all again. That gave us a matrix of a total of 16, but we simplified it and we said, okay, well, it turned out that everything actually worked. And so our basic guidance here is 
you can use up to 32 gigabyte ECC UDIMs or non-ECC UDIMs with the machine. Again, you can see the main site article for more information about what we did and how we tested this. Okay, let's talk about the second big one that we get and that's around CPUs. Now we tested a total of 23 different CPUs in here. HPE actually told us that the system should support any CPU up to 71 watts, but they weren't necessarily sure what would happen is if you, know, you go up to some of the higher TDP parts. And so they actually specifically asked us to test that for them. And so that's what we're doing. And on that note, we started out with the Intel Xeon E 2288G. Now this is an eight core 16 thread part that is basically the highest end part that you can put in an LGA 1151 socket on the Xeon side right now. We didn't know if it would work, so it was kind of a test just to kind of test the upper limit of what the microserver Gen 10 Plus could handle. What we found out was that, guess what? It worked, no problem, but there was a catch. Although it booted into Windows fine, it worked what looked like it was gonna be perfect. It actually wasn't. When we loaded up, Prime 95, and we actually went and did a stress test of the CPU to see, hey, what happens if this thing gets loaded? What's gonna happen? We actually saw power consumption well in excess of 190 watts. And that's a big deal because that's actually more wattage than the DC power brick is rated for. You do not wanna run a configuration that's using more power than your power supply can handle. That is a recipe for absolute disaster. What's more, we actually tested that and we saw those kind of power consumption numbers and we only had the two DIMMs. We had one SSD and no PCIe add-in card installed. We had no hard drives in there. I and mean, this was absolutely a bare bones configuration. So what it looks like is we're not gonna recommend that you put the Xeon E 2288 in there. So over the course of testing 23 different processors, we kind of came up with a matrix. And this matrix kind of shows what we saw in terms of max power consumption in that minimal configuration. We then kind of looked at, okay, what are the ones that use over 130 watts? And the reason we use 130 watts as our cutoff point is because, you know, we figure you still kind of want some power to be able to power, say, four hard drives, which can use six and a half to nine watts of pop. And so you need to make sure that you're leaving some room for those. We also probably want, especially if you're going to go to a higher end CPU, you probably want to go put a NIC or some kind of adding card and you may wanna go power a solid state drive. And so when you look at what that looks like in terms of total power consumption, we really thought that about 130 watts was about the maximum that we felt comfortable recommending to our readers. We then took another filter and we said, hey, well, if power is one filter, we should also kind of give some idea in terms of what we think are the best values. So we think that if you're gonna go for high performance, really the best value for the power consumption that you're gonna see in the Gen 10 Plus is gonna be the Xeon E 2246G. Now this is a six core model, has 12 threads, and we think that that is just about the highest model that we would put in a system like this and still feel kind of safe. There are other options like the Intel Core i3-9100F, which falls somewhere between the Pentium Gold and the Xeon E 2224 that ships standard. It's about you know a little over $90. It's not super expensive, but we think that that has a lot of value, especially if maybe you don't need the full Xeon experience, or maybe you need something that's a little bit faster than Pentium Gold. I think that's a pretty good sweet spot in terms of price performance. We have another four models that we think, you know, those are ones that if you got a really good deal, or maybe there's some specific need that maybe you'd wanna go look at, there's another four models that we're gonna have on this chart, and then we have more detail on on the main site where we think that you know you may want to go look at those because they could present good options. So of our total universe of say 26 chips, 23 we actually got to test, three we inferred, we found that there are about 10 chips that kind of make sense and really six that you should focus on or four to upgrade that you should focus on. And by the way, if you're watching this video and you're wondering what the heck is going on over here, this very light spot, it's actually because we're not in our normal studio and so we have some light coming in through a window what are you gonna do? Okay, so the next question we get is around the HPE ILO enablement kit, and specifically, what happens if you were to go get an ILO advanced license? Now, 
If you get the ILO enablement kit, not only do you get the dedicated NIC port, but you also get the ability to use the onboard i350 AM4 as a shared NIC. Now the ILO enablement kit comes with basically ILO essentials, but you could go out and buy an ILO advanced license and load it up on the microserver Gen 10 Plus. So in edge deployments, something that is used more often than a lot of people will recognize is the idea of using a shared network port for your management and also a primary networking port. Now, the reason you do this is it just means that you need less switch ports. It's you know a little bit less expensive to run. And so some people do it, especially on the edge, instead of using a dedicated network port for management, you use a shared network port. With the ILO enablement kit, you can do this, no problem. But when we put on an ILO Advanced license, we thought, hey, that should be a feature of ILO Advanced. So what would happen if we pulled out the ILO enablement kit? Do we need to have the extra minimal power consumption for that enablement kit if we're not using the dedicated NIC and instead we're using the share port? Because, hey, maybe that, that'll work. We tried this, it didn't work. Every time you reboot the machine, even if you have ILO Advanced installed and activated on the machine, you won't be able to use the shared network port feature you need to have the ILO enablement kit, even with an ILO advanced license activated on the system. Kind of a bummer, but it's something that we had a lot of people ask about and that's the deal. All right, let's talk storage for a little bit. Now, one of the really cool things and fun things that we did that we definitely don't recommend is we actually hit 140 terabytes of raw storage on a micro server Gen 10 Plus, and that's a single unit. The reason we did this is we wanted to test using external hard drives with the microserver Gen 10 Plus. External hard drives are very common because you'll see places like photography studios, you'll see people use them, for example, for just backups. And so a lot of people plug USB 3 hard drives into edge servers like this. Instead of doing just one, we said, hey, well, we have four 14 terabyte drives inside the machine. What if we instead had you know, six 14 terabyte drives outside of the machine. And we just tested all of the USB ports at once. And, you know, we could see if that indeed would work. And so we got a whole bunch of these Western Digital Easy stores and we hooked them up. And what did we get? Well, you can see the result. We had 140 terabytes of raw storage, which in a ZFS pool, we put them all together and we got 127 terabytes ready to go in a new Z pool. Again, this is something we totally would not recommend, but we just did it kind of as a fun little bit and also just to see if we could load all USB ports up at once. And we did want to note one thing that's really important. All the drives that we use actually have their own DC input, and that's important because they're externally powered. And by being externally powered, what that means is that they're not pulling power to run the drives off of the microserver Gen 10 Plus. By using drives that have their own power, we essentially weren't using power from that 180 watt microserver Gen 10 plus power brick. There are options out there, especially two and a half inch drives where you can get hard drives that use power straight off of the USB bus, but then you do have to worry about whether or not you're gonna overload that power brick. Okay, let's talk hard drives for a minute. Now we tested both 5400 RPM, but also 7200 RPM three and a half inch drives inside the chassis. And if you take a look at these 14 terabyte 5400 RPM drives that we have, what you're gonna notice is that they work pretty darn well. Each of these 14 terabyte drives that we put inside, each use about six and a half watts, which means that all together, you get somewhere around 26 watts of power from these four drives. Now we tested the HPE ProLiant Microserver Gen 10 Plus with 7,200 RPM drives as well. Specifically, we used HGST 10 terabyte units just to see if there was enough cooling capacity inside the chassis for those kind of higher wattage, higher power drives. And there was enough cooling capacity. However, they use a lot more power and using that much more power means that there really isn't that much room, especially if you wanna have a NIC, potentially an external SSD, or Overall recommendation is that you stick to 5,400 RPM drives, keep cool drives, low power drives, and have a bigger power budget, especially if you're gonna upgrade the CPU or something like that. One other huge note on the hard drive side is that these drive bays are not hot swap drive bays. We've seen quite a few people online and people that really realistically should know a lot better say that they're hot swap drive bays. They are not. Turns out when you do hot swap drives and drive bays, you actually need a very specific 
power pin out and data pin out to be able to safely power on and drive. And these, because they're cabled in the back, they don't have that pin out, which means they are not hot swappable. So if a drive fails, you pull the drive out and you put the new drive back in, you will not see that drive until you reboot the server. That has some big implications and that's one of the reasons that this unit did not get our editor's choice award even though we don't give it out very often, it was very close and that was one of the deciding factors. And finally, we just wanna say, you see all these Western Digital Easy Store enclosures, we were very successful liberating the 14 terabyte, 12 terabyte, 10 terabyte drives from those enclosures and using them in the microserver Gen 10 Plus. And you might ask, well, why would you do that? Well, there are four drives, and if you can save over $100 per drive, $150 a drive, that's somewhere between $400 and $600 of savings for somewhere around six or seven minutes of time opening the drives up and pulling the drives out. So if you wanna go do it and you're into shucking drives, that's something that is totally gonna to work with the microserver Gen 10 Plus. And just to give you some numbers on that, We've done that now with 12 drives on the 14 terabyte side, eight drives on the 12 terabyte side, and eight drives on the 10 terabyte side. So we've done it with quite a few drives at this point. You're probably gonna wanna use an SSD or maybe more than one SSD in the microserver Gen 10 Plus because, hey, it's 2020s, why not? Now, HPE actually sent us a two and a half inch SAT SSD, so we're gonna start there. And that is the HPE Samsung PM883 240 gig SSD that's up there. Now, what you're gonna see with this is that you can't actually place that SSD in the microserver Gen 10. Plus, because the way that the bays are, you actually need to have little pegs and those little pegs only work with three and a half inch drives. So what you need is an adapter. Now, there are a whole bunch of different adapters that you can go buy. We use these HP adapters, they're very inexpensive. We have tons of them because we use them all over the place and they work really well for us. So we have more information on those on the STH main site. Go check that out. Another point that we wanted to mention is that you actually can use a SAS SSD or multiple SAS SSDs with this chassis, even though they're not hot swap, you can still use them. In this price range, we really think that most folks are just gonna use SATA. And one of the more important things about using SAS SSDs in here is that by using a SAS SSD, you can use a RAID controller but that external RAID controller is gonna sit in your PCIe slot, which means you can't get higher speed networking. So if you go to high speed SAS SSDs, you can't use high speed network to serve data from those SSDs to the network, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. So we're gonna say that you're probably gonna use SATA SSDs and you, know, you can use whatever you want. They cost a lot more than traditional hard drives, but there are some cases and a lot of cases where that may make sense especially at lower capacities. So you can also use SSDs on the internal PCIe Gen 3 by 16 slot. If you wanna use SATA SSDs, what you wanna look for is a PCIe card, specifically a low profile PCIe card that has a SATA controller built in. You can get up to two M2 SATA drives installed into that slot, and that actually is a pretty good option if you just need a couple extra drives. Now, if you wanna look at NVMe drives, that's something a little bit different. Now, we actually checked, and you can use PCIe bifurcation, and in theory, you don't need a special M2 adapter card with a PCIe switch on there. There are cards like the StarTech one that you don't even have to deal with that because it has a switch built in. We have information on that on the STH main site. Still, we generally say don't use a PCIe switch if you don't need to because it adds power consumption to a power constrained environment. You also have added cost. And so if you don't need that, we suggest not doing it. The other option that you have is that there are actually cards that use two PCIe SSDs effectively on a single normal add-in card. And those are things like, you know, you can look at something like the Intel DC P3608, which was a pretty, popular example of that kind of card. There are newer versions of that, and that's something to just look at because there are two, essentially two SSDs that are on a single add-in card. Of course, the disadvantage is if you do use that PCIe slot for SSDs, it also means that you don't get high-speed networking, or at least 10 gig plus networking on the platform. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what you can do if you can't really use SSDs in that PCIe slot, and you're just kind of looking at how do I add a boot SSD because that's important to me? Well, if that's the case, the HP ProLiant Microserver Gen 10 Plus can actually boot off of USB media, which means you can get a USB 3 SSD and just use that. 
And we did, we actually have the Seagate One Touch 500 gig drives, they're about $70 or so. They've worked fabulously. We actually have one for each one of these servers because they work so well. And so that's a really good option. They don't use much power and they're reasonably fast. They can do about up to about 400 megs, three and 400 megs per second transfer, which is actually pretty good. And most importantly, they don't take up a drive bay. They didn't, don't take up a PCIe slot. They're super easy to integrate. Now, if you want to go fast, there are other options. And specifically what you can do is you could take the USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports on the front. Now there's two of those and you can actually get a faster SSD. So we have the one terabyte crucial X8 SSD, which is a Gen 2 device. And with that, we can actually hit speeds of about one gigabyte per second. Again, we don't need an internal NVMe drive. This thing just works and you just plug it in. We also have used a couple of the less expensive USB 3 or SATA to USB 3 converters. We had a Sabrent one that used, you know, say two and a half inch SSD to USB 3. And that worked, you know, just fine. Uh, it was only about $10. So if you already have a two and a half inch drive, then that's an option. It's also a little bit bigger than some of these purpose-built external SSDs are. It's not as durable, but you know, it is an option. One of the kind of fun things is actually that if you do use these USB SSDs, then technically because they're USB, those are hot swappable drives while the internal drive bays are not hot swappable. That's kind of fun. Also, another thing that's really important is that if you are powering these devices, most of these SSDs are powered off of USB bus power. And if you do that, they do count against that 180 watt total system power limit that you have because of the external power supply. So keep that in mind, especially if you're gonna use a lot of them, that's a big deal. If you're only gonna use like one of these 500 gigabyte Seagate drives, they really use only a couple watts each, so it's not a big deal at all. But the Crucial drive, because it's a higher performance drive, certainly does. Okay, so let's talk networking real quick. One of the options that we looked at, especially if you only want two and a half gig ethernet, is that we saw a cable creation USB 3 ethernet adapter that was very inexpensive. It was tens of dollars, something like $30 or something like that. It was very inexpensive to use and it worked perfectly fine. You can actually see in the review shot that we used that specific adapter on one of these microserver Gen 10 Pluses. It works fine. And if you only need two and a half gig ethernet, that's a pretty easy way to go. You can also use some of the internal adapters if you wanted to use your PCIe slot for that. You can use, for example, we looked at the CyberNix. We also looked at the TrendNet solution. And so there are NICs available, single and dual port options, very easy to add. Also two and a half gig ethernet, tends to use under five watts of power, even for dual port configurations. So overall, there's not a huge power impact when you are power limited. Now moving up to 10 gigabit ethernet, there are really a couple things to keep in mind. First, if you use 10 G base T, that's gonna use more power, it's gonna generate more heat, and there is only so much cooling that you have inside on that PCIe slot. So you have to be a little bit careful in terms of what you're using. My general recommendation is go get a SFP plus 10 gig ethernet solution. If you can use SFP plus, use that. If you do need five gigabit base T or you need 10 gig base T, use an SFP plus adapter. A lot of times it's actually cheaper to buy the SFP plus adapter plus getting a module that can convert it to base T. And the other thing is it gives you a little bit more surface area in order to dissipate heat. So it actually works fairly well in this configuration. And that is our general advice is go do that. Now we have looked at a couple different options here. What you're probably gonna wanna do is you probably wanna get a newer 10 gigabit ethernet adapter. And really what we're talking about here is at the absolute oldest, you're gonna want something that's Intel X520 based or newer. One of the newer options that we tested was actually the Intel 710 adapter. And we actually can use a four port model you do have to be a little bit careful because with the 710, there actually is a larger full height model and a low profile model. You want the low profile model for this unit, but if you do use that, you can actually get quad 10 gigabit ethernet ports in the microserver Gen 10 Plus, which is a very cool use case. And specifically the reason it's a cool use case is it allows for node to node direct connect networking. There are some cases where you may wanna use that 
actually we're starting to see some Azure stack and some other edge services start to adopt that, especially in very small cluster sizes when you have say two, three, four nodes. And so having that many 10 gig ethernet ports really helps. We're also just gonna really quickly notice that HPE has their own 10 gigabit ethernet units that they certify for this device. So if you wanna stay in the world of cert certified hardware, you certainly can do that as well. Okay, let's talk about 25 gigabit ethernet solutions. We actually tried a lot of them. Our general recommendation is to use a Mellanox ConnectX 4 LX solution. You can get single or dual port. Generally recommend dual port just because it's not that expensive. You can also use the SFP Plus to 10G base T adapters and get base T if you want it, and they'll run a 10 gig ethernet as well. So, you know, that's a nice bit of flexibility, especially if you think you might be upgrading your edge infrastructure at a later date. We've also tried Broadcom units. We've even tried a really cool HPE quad 25 gig ethernet just q logic based adapter we tried it in here it's a little bit loud so it's probably not something that we want to tell people to go use but you actually can use it as long as you have the low profile bracket it's a quad port adapter that runs all four ports out of a single qsfp 28 port and so you can actually get 100 gigabits worth of networking out of your microserver gen 10 plus i'm not sure why you'd want to but you could and that kind of brings us into the 40 and 100 gig ethernet discussion. You totally could use a 40 gig or 100 gig ethernet adapter with these units. But at some point, kind of the question is like, why? If you're gonna get that high end networking, well, you know, realistically, you probably wanna to go to a different class of machine. And also some of the 40 gig and some of the 100 gig ethernet adapters use a lot of power and generate a lot of heat. And that's not good either for your power budget, but also just for keeping things cool and quiet in your microserver Gen 10 Plus. So generally we would say 10, 25 gig ethernet makes kind of sense, but going beyond that, especially even that quad port 25 gig ethernet adapter, we'll give you details on it on the main site, but not something that we're gonna recommend at this point. Okay, now if you wanna get really out there, there is a solution that we wanted to cover, and that is over here on this side, what you're gonna see is this purple board with a copper heatsink, and that is a QNAP. I have no idea, we're gonna have the model number in the description, because I'm not gonna be able to say it. it's too long. We're also gonna have it on the main site, so go check that out. But there's this QNAP unit that actually uses an Aquantia 10 g base t controller plus two M.2 NVMe ports on it. Using this adapter in a single slot, you can get both 10 G base T as well as two NVMe SSDs. Now the card itself is somewhere in the 230 to say $250 range. It's not super inexpensive and there's probably another reason you don't wanna use this card. The way this card is architected, there's a PCIe Gen 2 by four link to the main system. And off that, there's a PCIe switch that then goes to both the NVMe SSDs as well as the controller for the NIC. And so when you look at what happens, you actually only get two PCIe Gen 2 lanes that go to each NVMe SSD. So that's four lanes. And then you also get some lanes going to the 10 G base T controller. And what that practically means, if you're thinking about it, wait, wait. Now, so PCIe Gen 2 is about half as fast as PCIe Gen 3. And instead of getting a full four lanes, we only get two lanes. So that's right, you effectively get the performance of a single lane PCIe Gen 3 device or storage device from that NVMe SSD. That's, in terms of performance these days, not very fast at all. And it gets even worse because if you think about it, you have four links, four PCIe Gen 2 links to the main system, but then you have four just on your NVMe devices. So what happens to the network controller? So it turns out if you're actually running the network controller at the same time that you're accessing your SSDs, you can actually get so much contention that you cause lower network traffic and lower SSD bandwidth because of that. So in absolute best case, it kind of works okay, but realistically, this is a solution that works. It looks kind of cool, QNAP marketed it, but it's something that we would say, stay the heck away from. Instead, that $230, $240 is much better spent getting USB 3.2 Gen 2 SSD, like that Crucial X8 one terabyte unit that we use. You can still get actually more sequential performance out of a SSD like that than you can with an internal NVMe SSD if you're on a PCIe Gen 2 by two link. So certainly just go get the USB drive and save yourself all that money and trouble of trying to get this really fancy QNAP device because it worked. 
we thought it was gonna be really exciting and it turned out that it, well, it kind of wasn't. Well, one thing is for darn sure, we have covered a lot of ground just in this video alone, but we actually have a lot more that is on, you know, this whole setup on the STH main site. So we're gonna tell you, go check out the STH main site for kind of more description, more power consumption numbers, some of the model numbers that we weren't able to go and share on this video. We have a much bigger guide, very in depth on this. And not only that, we're gonna keep that guide updated. So as we find different options, we're gonna go put more information into that guide. So there's a single resource where anybody that's thinking about modding one of these microserver gen 10s you can go to a single place and see things that everybody in the community, as well as what we've tested, all in one place. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed this video. This took an enormous amount of work, as you can see, and we had to go buy extra systems. We had to buy tons of different devices to be able to go hack together different configurations. But I think at the end of it, we actually came up with a lot of really good advice in terms of what you can use, what you can't use, and some of the ways that we think about configuring our systems as we take these systems from test systems and start to use them for our own purposes. If you like this video, help support the site by subscribing to our YouTube channel and turn on notifications so you can see whenever we come out with a new video. You can also check out some of the things that we've already uploaded on YouTube. And at the end, I just wanted to say thanks for watching and have an awesome day.